This is Ron Guttardi, volunteer director of the Oral History Program aboard the battleship New Jersey. Today is April the 1st, 2017, and we're aboard the battleship New Jersey today, and we have with us Mr. Joseph Puda of Port Clinton, Ohio, and uh, he's going to tell us about his time aboard the battleship New Jersey in the 1950s. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Welcome aboard. Is this your first time back on the New Jersey? Yes. And uh, how did you find it walking around today? What, what? Well, actually, this is all arranged by my daughter and son-in-law. They arranged all this as far as this trip. And what are your impressions of the New Jersey from what you well, remember? Well, you know, it brings back a lot of memories and stuff like that, but uh, 67 years is a long time, and a lot of the stuff I can relate to, and some of the stuff I, you know, just can't. So I was only 17 years old when I was on here. And how old are you today, Joe? 84. 84. Okay. Well, let's start this conversation by uh, you just telling us how you got into the Navy. Uh, pardon? How did you get into the Navy? What motivated well, you? my buddies and I, when we were younger, we decided we were going to go down, join the Naval Reserve. So we did. While you were still in high school? Yeah. Okay. And needless to say, I had a job, and uh, I came home one day from work, and there's an envelope that says, Greetings. So I had a report to Bainbridge, Maryland. This was in when? 1950? 1950. 1950. Okay. And uh, I was the only one that left the uh, Cleveland Terminal Railroad Station. And we stopped at Brenton, Ohio to pick up another uh, fellow that was going to Bainbridge. He was from the uh, Akron Naval Station. And I never drank or anything in my life at all. And he was a little older than I was. So we decided to go to the lounge car and have a drink. Well, one thing led to another, and there was another fellow over there that was by himself, and he uh, wanted to invite him over to the table, and you know. So another draftee? Another draftee? Pardon? Another guy who was drafted by the Navy? He was in the Navy, yeah, yeah. also. He was from the Naval Air Station. And uh, needless to say, we got to having a few drinks, and I woke up in Bainbridge, Maryland, you know, and that started my career to learn how to say yes, sir, or no, sir, because I was an orphan and I didn't have a father figure or anything like that. You know, I was raised by my grandmother and she came from Poland and all she knew was hard work. So, and we lived in an ethnic neighborhood, didn't have any other nationalities except European nationalities. And when I got into the service, and I don't exactly remember where I was, but that was during the days of segregation. I just remember drinking fountains were black and white. And being Catholic, I went to church one Sunday morning, and there was a black person in church. That blew my mind because we never had any black people like that in, you know, in, a, in our neighborhood, never associated with them. So, uh, and then one thing led to another, and I got transferred when after boot camp. I was the only one that got sent to the New Jersey. And uh, my sea bag weighed more than I did at that time. And when I got aboard ship, it was at night. How do you know, do you know how they picked you for the New Jersey? No, I don't. Okay. I don't know whether it had to do with uh, what I was doing because there was a lot of a lot of guys, some guys at Baker, they put them in a carpenter shop, you know, and stuff like that. So yeah. And then uh, that was common. school, I was involved with a lot of machine shop stuff, so Maybe that's why they sent me there, so anyway. Had you had some machine ch training before you got into the Navy? Oh, yes. Where, in high school? At uh, Eagle uh, Trade School there in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Is that what you were attending? Yeah. Okay. Did you, fin did you finish high the high school level uh, before you got into the Navy? Well, actually, it was the trade school level. And, but you did know, you finish it? Yeah. And uh, we did drafting and machine shop work and... Uh, the foundry did some parts for us, and we had to machine them and stuff. But in fact, I still have a drill vise that I made in 1949 that okay. I made. And uh, so, where did you pick up the New Jersey in Norfolk? In Norfolk, Virginia. 
And when you saw it the first time, do you remember? Well, it blew my mind. I never seen anything so big. The jersey was on one side of Pier 7, and a lady was on the other side of Pier 7. So there was a battle, a battleship and an aircraft carrier. And I'm 17 years old. Like I say, the sea bag was heavier than I was. I got aboard ship. The officer of the deck told me I had to go down that hatch and all I had with the red lights on. And I said, no way I'm going to take this sea bag down there because, you know, it's too heavy. So I just let the sea bag go and I went down after it. And the next morning when I woke up, one of the electricians aboard ship took me up to the captain's cabin. I was up on a bridge the next morning watching a, a, an airplane not caught on fire on an aircraft carrier lady. You know, I didn't know where I was at that time. And first time I was around this. And, but it was an enjoyable experience and uh, uh, had some good times, had some bad times and uh, you know, being away from home and stuff like that. And the only thing that, there's times when I remember saluting the officer to deck and, and, uh, and a flag coming aboard ship off of Liberty in Cuba uh, when I had a sombrero on and I had my white hat on top of my sombrero when I was eating a banana and I saluted the officer to deck. I mean, that was party time, you know. And a uh, bunch of young, you do stupid things like that. But the thing that upsets me most is when we were in Cuba, which was not a hostile country at that time, we had anchored out because we were taking on ammo. Or I think we had to anchor out. We couldn't tie up at, at the dock. So. Was it Guantanamo Bay? Yeah. And uh, they were getting ready to show movies on a fan tail there. They had to screen down. And here come two frogmen, as they called it in those days. They got under an underwater demolition team. I'm walking up the gangplank, he told the officer to deck, he said, we just sank your ship. And after that, they put lights all around the ship for security, and we had a patrol in motor launches around the ship, you know, for security reasons. Did you have to do that in every port? Whenever no, when no, that was only at that one particular time we had to do that. When we anchored in... Uh, uh, Sherberg and stuff like that, we were able to you know, dock because I gave the museum the Sherberg newspaper when I went to the class reunion, ship reunion in uh, Vegas. Uh, there was a picture of the New Jersey and the Queen Mary docked back to back to one of the biggest ships in the world at that time. And uh, what kind of got me is that when that USS Cole was docked in Tehran, which was a hostile country at that time, they had no security around a vessel. And they didn't learn their lesson after 50 years, you know. And there they got a whole boat on the side of the ship and 17 sailors killed because the powers to be didn't learn their lesson. So and that kind of blew my mind and uh, upset me hardly. And it should have never happened. When you first uh, reported aboard the battleship New Jersey, were you uh, a machinist or a fireman at that time? Well, basically I was a fireman, but uh, my duty, I was assigned to the machine shop. Okay. And we used to uh, do a lot of machining and sharpen a lot of uh, paint scrapers for the deckhands and chip paint and stuff. And uh, Did you go to a B school? Did you go to a B school, a Navy B school? Uh, no. And no advanced training? No. Okay. And uh, then I was assigned to refrigeration. And we used to make ice and stuff like that for the cooks and stuff so they could make, uh, they used to make powdered lemonade. And we used to be in good with the tailors because we used to give them blocks of ice and they used to press our uniforms for us. So when it comes to um, a roster here, we had to gather on deck out there. You know, we had the best looking uniforms on a boat, you know, how did ship they, at that time. How did they use the ice? In the, how did they use the ice, the tailors? Well, they used it to keep cool, you know, they, to, oh. because we had no air conditioning, no nothing. And okay. there's times when we were down in uh, uh, 
tropics, Azores, and stuff like that. It's hot, and we used to take our bunks, pillows, and stuff and go up topside and sleep under the turrets where they used to have blowers blowing air out there, you know. And we used to sleep on the decks up topside at those days, but, uh, you know, there was, uh, like I say, had a lot of good times, and uh, it's something that I think every, every boy, especially in this day and age, should be in, you know, learn how to go in there and say yes sir, no sir, and, and uh, have a lot of respect for the water because we got caught into a, a storm out there on this ship and we couldn't open the hatches below the O2 level. Below the O2 level, we couldn't open the hatches. I mean, it was... Where uh, were you? What uh, sea were you in? It was in the Atlantic. In the Atlantic. Where, and uh, uh, she was really cranking that day and I had pictures and when I got transferred to the Des Moines, I didn't take them with me. I had slides and I was taking pictures of when the bow would come up and come back down and the water would just fly, you know, both directions and and it was amazing. And it gave me a lot of respect for the water. You know. And do you know how high the seas were, the, the waves, how high they were at that time? Well, we were going to go up to launch the air, uh, planes on the aircraft carrier, so the fleet had to get up to flank speed. And the carrier was taking waves over the flight deck. So they had to secure the planes, and needless to say, we never, uh, you know, finished that maneuver. And the flight deck must have been a good 50 feet above the uh, the water? Oh, it was, it was, and I remember one other time I got sick on a dog down in the, uh, my, in, my, I had a watch, 48 watch, down in the boiler room, and I was sicker than a dog. So the officer at deck relieved me, told me to go up topside, and I laid there on the deck on a fantail there, and the waves were higher than the boat. I mean, we were, we were, we were moving right along, and the waves were, if not higher, you know, as high as the deck on a boat. I just laid there, and I didn't care if somebody rolled me over the side, I was dying that day. But was that early in your time oh of working yeah, in New yeah, Jersey? Oh yeah, when I was when well, you were st still green. Your yeah, sea, yeah, didn't get your sea legs yet. Yeah, I. Uh, but then after that, I I say ran charters on the Great Lakes for thirty some years almost, and been in some rough water out there. Never got sick or anything, you know. So I guess I learned my lesson. So. All right, you were in the in on the New Jersey in the early 1950s. Did the New, New Jersey go to uh, Korea at that time while you were aboard? The, 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 what did, did the New Jersey go to Korea while you were aboard? No, no, I didn't make it over to Korea. It just came back uh, when I got aboard, and I spent my three years on it. And then it was scheduled to go back to Korea, and that's when they shipped me over to the Des Moines because they would have to ship me back from Korea because I was just getting out of the service at that time. I didn't decide to re-enlist, so. But uh, I understand from some of the uh, veterans that on board that when they were hit over in Korea by a uh, shore battery, it had taken out the uh, hoist where they loaded the uh, projectiles for the 16-inch guns. It took that hoist out and the captain's gig. And the guys inside the turret didn't know they were hit. They didn't know that they, they were They didn't hit? know they were hit by a shore battery. Wow. Well, they, they, I, I understand that a shore, one of those turrets weighs as much as a destroyer. Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. I was in there one time at a friend of mine who was a gunner's mate. And uh, he took me up there when they were firing the four batteries there. And there was a catwalk back there around behind the breaches. And when they fired at one particular barrel there and that breach started coming back, I thought it was never going to stop. I thought I'm a dead man. You know, I seen this thing coming back at me. And uh, that was an experience. And one other time out at sea, we were having a holiday routine, and a gunner's mate had to clean the. Uh, the barrels on a five inch and one of the gunners mates was up there on a barrel and he was swabbing a barrel out and somebody inside swung the turret 
threw him over the side while we were out at sea on underway. Hmm. So needless to say, the man overboard went out and then takes a mile to turn this thing around, so we had to go back and get him. Did you get him? Oh, yeah. I'll uh, bet he was relieved. Well, <laughs> some of the stuff I remember when we used to have to walk. I had pictures. I don't have them. I wish I did, but I don't have them. We used to have a walk out on a yard arm, and you rode down a rope ladder to get to the Liberty boats that were tied up on a rope ladders. And I used to run the engine. They were Buddha engines. And there were only four cylinder engines. There were 30 foot motor launch, open motor launches. And we'd have to take Liberty parties ashore and go pick them up. Well, at nighttime, we'd have to go pick them up, and there'd be a, um, a coxswain, which would be a JG lieutenant, with a rail around the back. And, and uh, there was a stern hook and a bow hook, and, and myself. And as we approached the dock, Usually the stern hook would go wake up the bow hook because it was a little trip to get in there and be sleeping on the dock lines. And he woke him up and he had the dock line in his hand and he thought he was close to the dock and he jumped right over the side. We weren't nowhere near the dock yet. Who jumped over the side? The bow hook. He had the, he had the bow line in his uh -huh. hand, you know, and he thought he was close to the dock. Then he could jump on the dock and he jumped in the water. But, uh, there was one other time when we had to bring a Liberty Party back. It was in the daytime, uh, sun shining, wind blowing, and all. Yeah, it was a little snotty out there, but we had a bunch of drunks we were bringing back, and one side of the ship was taking our white hats and putting water in the boat, and the other side was taking the water and bailing out. And this ensign we had on a on a back over there, his knuckles were white. He was he was scared to death that we were going to sink this thing. Well. Uh, It was an experience, you know, and I think it's something I'll never forget. While you were aboard the New Jersey, did you ever leave the Atlantic Ocean? Were you always in the Atlantic? The Atlantic, did you spend, you, you never got to the Pacific? No. So you, did you get to the Mediterranean? No, we got to Lisbon, Portugal, Cherbourg, France, uh, Guantanamo, Cuba, or the ports we visited, you know, uh, at that time. And I remember one time out at sea, the SS United States, they had just built that uh, cruiser, I mean that the cruise ship, and they were on a speed run from the United States to Europe, France someplace, and I can remember them passing us at night in that cruise ship, you know. Was it going pretty fast? Yeah, they were moving along pretty good. I think it set a world record for, yeah. for crossing the Atlantic at that time. I don't know if that record still holds, but... It's that that ship is here in Philadelphia. It is. Yeah. Oh. It's uh, they're trying to salvage it, but uh, it's in pretty bad shape. Oh, sorry to hear that. So what uh, what ports do you? Uh, did, what was your favorite port? Port of call. Well, I thought Lisbon, Portugal. I thought was the prettiest city I've ever been in because they never saw war and all the buildings were white. And all they had was a Black Horse Square where they had a monument. There was uh, some kind of war hero, something on a horse that was painted black. And uh, that I thought was one of the prettiest places. One time when we were anchored and we got to go out of Liberty in Cuba, and again, you know, 18 years old, 19 years old, the train that we were going into Cuba on, and we were the first ship to go into Cuba back then because they wouldn't let the Navy. Uh, sailors go into Cuba because some sailor got a snootful and he urinated all over our, one of their statues of one of their war heroes, so they banned the Navy for a couple of years and they let us, we were the first ones to go in there. And the train was so slow that the kids were running alongside the train begging for money and, you know, cigarettes and stuff. And the train was going from where? Guantanamo? We were going from Guantanamo Bay to, to Guantanamo to. City. Okay. And uh, there was somebody selling uh, whiskey on the train, so we bought a bottle of whiskey. And when we got on to Guantanamo City, we went into some bar that was air conditioned because it was hot on a fruitcake down there. And we told the bartender that we'll just, 
buy a wash from him, and when we finish that bottle, we'll buy from him. You know, needless to say, we finished that bottle and never did buy from him, and you know, went on our merry way. And different episodes that uh, one of the Marines, his name was Bullock, uh, was a friend of mine. Uh, we were on liberty, and he was out of uniform. He had no shoes. He had no hat. He had all trained it in for some sex. He traded his shoes and stuff, and he was out of uniform. So I told him, I said, before the shoulder toad gets you, I says, just stay here and out of the way, and I'll go back and get you some clothes so they don't write you up, you know. But, you know, we did dumb things like that. Was this Marine from the New Jersey? He was, he was stationed on a boat, on a ship, yes. They had a Marine detachment at the time? Do yeah, you know? we had, I think we had 60 of them, I think. 60? Yeah. I think we were 60 on here at that time. But uh, how about France? How about uh, Port of Call in France? What? Well, in France, in Cherbourg, France, I went to see a movie with Mademoiselle Evelyn Fontaine, who was a girl in France, and we went to see a movie called Vengeance Valley with Burt Lancaster. And it was an English movie, but all the uh, vocalization was done in French. And I thought that was funnier, funny as could be at that time. And I was having a riot in there with, you know, listening to these cowboys talking in French and stuff. And there was one guy, I think it was in Lisbon, Portugal. I had pictures of that, and a lot of this stuff got lost in the shuffle. And he had a bottle of uh, wine or something. And he had climbed over a picket fence, a steel picket fence, and he was trying to get up on this uh, monument of this general of some kind or on a horse. And there was a little ledge out there, and he's got this bottle of wine or whiskey, whatever it was. He, was, he had it stuck between him and his chest, and he's hanging on this ledge, trying to get up there to climb up on that horse to drink some wine or whiskey, whatever. Well, needless to say, the shore patrol got him. But I had pictures of that stuff, you know. There was a lot of dumb things that were done in those days, you know. Young guys that were, were here and there, you know, so we don't know them, and, you know. So, but again, like I say, I thought it was a, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, uh, I think we had an admiral, four-star admiral on a ship at that time. I don't remember his name. Uh, these are four or five stars, but uh, uh, like I say, we just, there's a lot of good memories, good memories, you know. And, and when I was, met this girl, Emily Fontaine, in, in Cherbourg, France, they had a family day. And she thought I was going to marry her and bring her back to the States. And they had family day. And, they let some of the families in France come aboard ship, so her and her family were down there waiting to come aboard ship, and needless to say, there was no way I was going to meet up with her because I had a girlfriend back here at home that waited for me while I was in the service for three years, and then we married, had nine children, and she passed away two years ago, and we were married for 62 years. So we were actually together 65 years, so, and uh, when she passed away out in Arizona, I felt like I went full circle because I was an orphan, and when my son decided to take her to his house, which he had more room, and it was a lot easier on me because it was a lot of work taking care of she had a stroke and she had no no building in her left leg and left arm, so she was in a wheelchair. And it was a lot of work to take care of her, even though I had a couple of care, caregivers. But when she passed away, I, I don't, there was nothing for me out there. Like I said, I didn't have a gun, a horse, or an ATV. So I came back here to live with my second oldest, uh, second youngest son, who's 50 years old now. and. He's got my boat. We've been refinishing it. We do a lot of fishing and golfing together and stuff like that, you know. And then my other kids come to visit and so on and so forth. And, but uh, 
Tell us about uh, aboard the New Jersey. <clears throat> how, how did you get along with the officers? Never had any problems. The only time I got in any association to do with the officers, we were in the uh, refrigeration aspect of the ship, and we had to take care of the air conditioning and refrigeration in the officers' quarters and stuff like that because they had air conditioning. We didn't. And we were in a captain's cabin, and on his coffee table he had some girly books. So needless to say, you know, we're 18, 19 years old, we're sitting there reading these girly books, and we got caught by the officer, you know, in charge. And he told us that he wouldn't write us up. At that time there was a picture of Marilyn Monroe on a red velvet background and he wanted one of those pictures and he said if we could get him one of those he wouldn't write us up well needless to say we couldn't get him one and i wound up getting four hours extra duty down in the mess hall uh, working with a cook down there a baker and he was making a big tray of some kind of cake flat cake of some kind of, and he was only going to make half a batch but instead of putting half of the liquid in, he put the, all the liquid in, and it's nothing but a bunch of water. They had to take it up topside and throw it over, you know. But that's about the only association I had with officer board ship. We had an officer in the, in, in the engineering department that was uh, pretty nice. I don't remember his name, but he brought out the prince of the Jersey and the Missouri and showed us that the Jersey is longer than the Missouri. By a couple inches. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, but other than that, you know, I had no problem with officers or anything like that. Was... Did you form any uh, lasting friendships among your crewmates? No, you know, not really. I had, there was one guy that lived in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, on Memphis Avenue, and we used to come home, we had a 72 hour pass. If somebody had a car that lived in Ohio, we would get a couple, four guys together he'll pay for the gas and we'd drive from Norfolk, Virginia back up to Ohio to spend a weekend and stuff and we'd back and drive back. I don't remember his name, but I do remember one fellow from Ogden, Utah, his name was Reed Harris. He was a Mormon. And at that time I learned that I'll never discuss religion because you'll never get anywhere with it. Or uh, politics, you know. But there was one night we were, a bunch of us were down in the ice house, and you know, like I say, a bunch of young guys, I don't, know, I don't know how we got around to talking to religion, but being he was a Mormon, he was not supposed to be, uh, cavort and get tattooed and do all that stuff that he was doing, you know. And when we got done with him, he left, he left the ice house crying. And that's when I, I swear I'd never uh, discuss religion again, you know. The only thing I would discuss is weather. Whether she will or whether she won't. <laughs> but How about the reunions of the New Jersey? Have you been to a few of the... I uh, went to one in Las Vegas. I went there uh, to the reunion in Las Vegas and uh, my wife bought me a hat which I still have today. Do you remember what year it was that you went? Long time ago, long time ago. I don't remember when you, 20 years ago maybe. It's been quite a long time ago. Was that the only one you went to? Yeah, the only one I ever went to, yes. And uh, that's when I gave them that paper from the, new, from the Cherbourg, France, um, with that picture, you know. And I don't know if it's in the museum or not, but they said they would, you know, include that in there. I don't know what it happened to it. But again, like I say, uh, this is all my daughter and son-in-law's doings and I appreciate and, you know, they're learning to appreciate, you know, the time that I spent and a lot of things they didn't know and they're learning about me and stuff like that and... Did you, you know, sign the wall? Yes. Did you see anybody you know among the signatures? Not for the most part. You know, I, if I said, yeah, I'd be lying because there's just so many names and people that, you know, even a picture that I have of us sitting in a machine shop 
I don't know, we used to play Hearts, a card game by the name of Hearts. And we used to play that, and uh, I don't know if we were playing cards or writing letters or what, but it was, there were three of us in the machine shop down there. So, but, uh... So how do you feel about your time aboard the New Jersey? Did oh, how did I enjoy it, it. How did it impact your life? I enjoy it. It's, it's refreshing, so to speak, but there's a lot of changes, a lot of changes from when I was on board. And, you know, I wouldn't even remember because it's been so long ago and a lot of that stuff never really sunk in. But I can relate to some of the things, like in a machine shop, some of the equipment I used. And uh, it's like I say, I was as far forward on this vessel and as far aft as you could get. And I was as high as you could go, climb up on a mast and stuff like that. And I was underneath this thing when it was a dry dock. So where was your berth? Norfolk, Virginia. And Portsmouth, no, the, Virginia. Uh, where did you sleep on the ship? Oh, God, I don't know. Do you remember what deck? No. No, I don't. All I remember is that there were some stupid things that they did and was done. Like they, if your hand was hanging over the side, they'd, they'd put a warm, put your thumb in a warm bucket or water or something like that and you'd pee yourself. And then it holds you down and put shaving cream on you and shave your chest. You know, stupid things like that. And then inevitably the guy, that was the drunkest and the sickest slept on the top rack and when you go to sleep everybody takes their shoes off and puts them on a deck well needless to say when he leans over the side he fills your shoes up for you you know but that was you know and some other experiences that i don't relate to because we had some one time it was a commotion board, and being this all metal and everything like that, the fire hose was during night nighttime. We were sleeping, and there was all this commotion down there in the deck. And I don't know where it was exactly, but all I could hear is this guy had, and I saw him. He had a fire hose wrench in his hand, and he had this other guy by the throat. He said, you touch me one more time, he says, and I'll kill you. He said, you know, because we did have some strange people on board, so to speak. And it's unbelievable, and I don't know, I just, those are some of the experiences that I don't like to remember, so to speak. So when you uh, when your three years was up, did the Navy ask you to uh, re-enlist? Well, ask again, you? like I say, I had my girlfriend was waiting for me back home, and uh, I had a job that I uh, uh, was able to keep my seniority on in the job where I was working while I was in the service. What kind of job was it? Well, I was working in the uh, automotive. Uh, for TRW, and eventually we got into a lot of automation and, and stuff, you know, uh, and did that for 39 years and ran fishing charters. Used to run up to the lake, which is about 70 miles away. We had a trailer out there, and we used to run out on the weekends, run fishing trips on Saturday and Sunday, get up early Sunday morning, drive back in and go to work try to keep nine kids in tennis shoes, you know, so, okay, any other stories that you want to tell us about, Joe? Well, not that I can think of, you know, something may come later on, but right now, you know, I, I try to, you know, deep into the archives, but that's about the best I could do. Well, it was plenty good enough. We appreciate you taking your time today while you're aboard the ship to come and sit down to talk to us about your experiences aboard the New Jersey. And we want to thank you for your service as well. Welcome. And uh, 
I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay aboard the ship today. And with that, I'm going to sign off uh, by saying this is Ron Guttardi, uh, Volunteer Director of the Oral History Program on the Battleship New Jersey. And we've been talking with Joseph, Mr. Joseph Puda of Port Collins. Port Clinton. Port Clinton, Ohio, today. And today is April the 1st. 2017. And thanks again, Joe. Have a good day. Thank you.